This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of God, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's great to be able to, uh, to see you this morning on this bright, shiny day and, uh, and to be able to celebrate all of the good things uh, that, uh, that God has given to us. And so on this day, especially, there are two things uh, that focus our attention. Um, first is uh, uh, Mother's Day. Mother's Day, what an amazing thing. Um, so if you had a mother, would you please raise your hand? Well done. That gets pretty close to 99.9% .9 of us. And, uh, um, and if you are a mother, would you stand? All right. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. It's great. It's great. So this, this whole institution of motherhood and uh, what it means to be a mom uh, in a in a not an easy time uh, of our life together to be a mom uh, to be uh, able to raise kids and grandkids and run a household and do all of the things uh, in a very changing kind of culture and world uh, so uh, so uh, for and by the rest of us um, thank you uh, thank you for all of the work that you do um, every single day whether you have kids at home anymore or not uh, the role that you have is an important one. And, uh, and so we do celebrate this, uh, this, uh, this day of Mother's Day, uh, as I said, in a, in a world in which, um, in, in, a, in a fallen world, uh, in which we find ourselves um, <coughs> challenged in a variety of different ways. So for many, um, the day of Mother's Day is a bittersweet day. Um, my mother is no longer with us. Uh, she, she went to be home with the Lord uh, you know, probably, gosh, it must be 15 years ago now. And, uh, and my mom was, uh, I loved her. She was an important, uh, an important force in my life, and so that's a sad thing. And, uh, and we have to also say that there are, there are folks for whom Mother's Day is also bittersweet because they, they wanted to be moms and couldn't be moms. And so, uh, so, so to, to f the focus to be on Mother's Day can, can, uh, can evoke some, uh, some particular painful memories. Uh, we, our first child, when Darla was pregnant for the first time, um, uh, she, uh, that pregnancy lasted, and we, I can remember being excited about it, and, uh, and the pregnancy lasted about four months, and then we lost that baby. And uh, we named him Michael. And we still think of Michael and still pray for Michael. Um, and hope one day to be able to meet uh, Michael. Uh, so to, uh, to not be able to have children or to have a child in lost, uh, that's, a, that's a traumatic thing. And also, we have to say uh, in our day that not everybody's experience with their mothers is a positive one. Right? Right? Uh, so there are, uh, there are a variety of different kinds of experiences that people have had in their homes. So I had one woman uh, last week tell me that she wasn't going to come to church this Sunday because she didn't want to hear stories, happy stories about mothers because her relationship with her mother was not a happy one. And so we live in this world where there are very broken people and the experiences that we have uh, can oftentimes be painful. So we want to just acknowledge all of that. That's that life brings us to this place. And so then, uh, and so then we, we look to be able to ask the question, well, so how do we, how do we learn more about, uh, about not, not just mothers and what mothers' roles are, but all of us as we are called to be of impact in the lives of others? Where do we learn that? And so we come today, which is the fourth Sunday in the season of Easter, to uh, what is called Good Shepherd Sunday. Um, Good Shepherd Sunday. It is that time when we, uh, when we recognize the great statement on Jesus' uh, part that out of John 10 that I am the Good Shepherd. 
and, uh, and his particular relationship with, uh, with the sheep. The idea of being a shepherd is deep into the Old Testament as the people of God were looking for the one who would guide them and direct them. So Moses in the Old Testament was called a shepherd. King David was called a shepherd. Uh, there was also this yearning among the prophets for the shepherd who would come. And so then it's significant that Jesus would call himself the good shepherd. And so, uh, so we look to him to be able to, to hear what's not not just what's a shepherd, but what's a good shepherd, because, uh, because Jesus is our good shepherd, uh, but not only that, but he calls us as his followers to be shepherds, good shepherds, to follow his example. You remember the gospel lesson from last Sunday and the reinstitution of Peter, you know, after he had failed so badly, and then uh, the third resurrection appearance, and Jesus meets uh, Peter there on the, on the beach and calls him over to bring some fish, and, and he says uh, to Peter, uh, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, I love you, and then he s responds, well, then feed my sheep, and then the second time, Peter, do you love me? And yes, Peter, uh, yes, Jesus, you know that I love you, and then the second one is shepherd my sheep, guide my sheep, shepherd my sheep. So there was a command on Jesus' part that Peter kind of get over, embrace the forgiveness that he was given by Jesus and get in the game and be a shepherd for his sheep. And that's the calling not just of Peter, but that's a calling for every one of us as we are touched by Jesus, as our lives are changed by him. He gives to us those folks, our little lambs, that we are responsible for, and he calls us to shepherd them, to be able to take the responsibility to think through the eyes, to see through the eyes of Jesus, what is it, how is it that I can be a reflection of the good shepherd, provide leadership for the lives of these people that God has given to me. Because it's very easy in this world to be able to think, you know, it's just Jesus and me. Well, but it's not just Jesus and me. Because once Jesus touches you, then it's Jesus and you and all of the rest of you that Jesus has you doing ministry for. And so it's you and your group, you and your flock, you and your clan, you and your friends, you and your coworkers. It's all of these folks that God gives to us to shepherd. And so how do we know how to do that? Well, we look at our good shepherd, right? He's the one who teaches us how to do that. And we emulate him uh, as we take his qualities and characteristics and, and embody them in the, in the relationships that we have. And uh, so let me just, there's so much. Uh, this, is, this is, so John chapter 10 is all filled with this good shepherd imagery. So I would just, I would encourage you this week, just spend some time with John chapter 10 and, and think about it in terms of how it is that Jesus is our good shepherd and how then we are called to shepherd others. Uh, let me identify just three things, three ways in which Jesus is our good shepherd and, and, uh, and commands us uh, to be the shepherd of other folks. Um, the first one, is that the good shepherd knows his sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. So in this world, oftentimes, it is easy for us to feel like nobody understands me. Nobody really knows what goes on inside of me. Nobody knows what, what, uh, what scares me or what makes me happy. Uh, I'm really a mystery to the people around me and I feel cut off by everyone else. Uh, we have a good shepherd in Jesus who knows us. He knows who we are. He knows the deepest parts of what makes us function. He knows our wounds and he knows our strengths. He knows what scares us and what excites us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so as, uh, as he plums us and is kind of weaving himself in and through and around us, he speaks to us from the deepest levels by the spirit of, of anyone who is ever able possibly to know who we are or what we do. So we know that we have this, this friend 
who, who doesn't kind of impose himself from outside. He knows. He knows. However you feel misunderstood or, or, or overlooked or forgotten, he knows. He knows you. And he's there for you, made in his image and in his likeness, stirring you up to activity. And this, this power that comes when we know that even the darkest corners of our lives that seem like, you know, we, we live them in the shadows, he knows those, those places. And so he brings the opportunity for healing and wholeness. We can't hide anything from him. And so to be able to have this open relationship where we're not afraid to talk about the yucky stuff, you know, the places in the corner where there are kind of these dirt balls and, and cobwebs, he knows that they're there and helps us to be able to address them, to bring light and to clean, uh, to clean them up. He knows them. And so then there's this opportunity for us to be able to, as we look at the people who are around us, to be able to say, how well do I know them? If God has given to us res responsibility for a number of folks, whether they're friends or colleagues or family members or neighbors or whoever they are, uh, in this world in which we are all kind of moving around very fast with our own agendas, to be able to take the time to know one another so that uh, when you drive into your driveway after being gone all day and you see your neighbor who's across the street and you wave at them, you actually know what they're going through. So you know whether they're going through a divorce. You know whether there's cancer in their family. You know whether one of their kids is sick or upset. You know what's happening with them. So this opportunity for the people who are around us, for our relationships with our kids and our grandkids, do we really know them? Do we really know what makes them tick? To be able to take the time to, to keep the relationship open, transparent, and honest, to know that we are for them, wanting to help them and to be with them, to connect with them. This powerful, this, this issue of connecting with other people is a powerful tool that can have a, a lifelong impact on folks and empower them to be who they would not normally have been. Uh, Larry Crabb, uh, famous uh, uh, Christian psychologist, uh, has written a number of books, but he wrote one book called Connecting. And uh, as, a, as a somebody who'd spent his, his life as a therapist, um, he, he, uh, he you know, asked the question, so how important is it um, as just a human being to connect with one another, to actually know who one another is and to connect with them? And he talked about a patient of his. Uh, he'd known this guy for about uh, two years. And, uh, and over that a period of time, he'd gone through a particularly difficult time. And then, and then there was a kind of a turning for him. And then, uh, and then over a period uh, that was fairly short, uh, he was able to do well to be able to move on, and so he released him from his care. And so it came later on, uh, he was gonna be uh, moving out of town, and so he called back and he asked uh, Larry if he would come and have coffee with him and just tell him thank you, so that he could tell him thank you for what he'd done. And so they got together for coffee, and, uh, and so Larry Crabb is there, the professional therapist who's got, who is you know, wise and smart and all of these things. And so he asked uh, this former patient of his, he said, so what is it that I did. What one particular moment do you remember that was that was particularly powerful for you in your healing? Um, and in his own mind, he's thinking, was it you know when I examined your family of origin and we were able to kind of unwind all of those sticky places, or when it was was it when I kind of examined the unconscious motives and helped you to to recognize those? What was it in my toolbox that was so transformative for you? And he said, um, he said, well, you know. The thing that was the most important was I was sitting on a park bench one day and feeling particularly bad. And uh, you happened by and you saw me and you knew what I was going through and you stopped and came over and sat down beside me on that park bench and we just kind of chatted about nothing. That was the most important thing. I said, are you telling me 
all of those hours in my office, all of the skills that I brought to bear. And the most important thing <laughs> was us sitting down and just chatting about nothing on a park bench. And he said, yeah, that was it. Because I knew you cared. And then I knew you cared. Connecting, connecting with another human being who knows me is tremendously powerful. And oftentimes we pass up the opportunities. So then the second piece is, so, so to be able to know one another, and then the second piece is to provide for one another. You know, a good shepherd, one of the responsibilities of the good shepherd, of a shepherd, is to move the flock from one place to another. So when they've eaten all the grass in one spot, to be able to move them to where they know that he knows that the, that the grass is, uh, is, is lush and green, so that, uh, so that we can lie down, as the psalmist says, in green pastures and be beside the still waters so that the sheep can thrive. And so God does that for us. Jesus takes us to these places when we've, when we've kind of used up the resources in one part of our lives. He, he keeps on uh, taking us to places where we can grow. You know, it's not possible to be a Christian and not growing. It is not possible to be a Christian and not growing. Because if you do, then the process of just deterioration sets in. For us, this good shepherd pokes us. You ever been poked? He sh pokes us and he prods us and he gets us to move on to green pastures. He provides the things that we need, even if we don't know that we need them at the time. And so we are invited as we look at these folks who are around us that God has entrusted, given us the precious gift of entrusting them into our hands for us to be able to ask the question, what does this person need? And what resources do I have that I can share with them so that they can receive the, the, the blessings and the richness of the life that God gives uh, to them or can give to them? And it, it can be as simple as, uh, as opening the door for them. You know, there's research uh, in, about churches that, that newcomers, visitors who come to churches um, and, and, and why it is that they stay. And they found that if, if a visitor uh, comes for six Sundays and can name six other people by name, they'll stay. This opportunity to build friendships, and relationships. And so how does that happen? It happens because the people who are currently there introduce them to the other people who are their friends. There's a, an opening the door, an entryway into this community. It says, it says that, let me introduce, so you're new, and so let me introduce you to my friends. And there's an entree into this place. It's an, introdu an introduction into my life group or into my Bible study, or into my small group in some place, to be able to help, help them build relationships and to be able to, to, to learn more about, the, about who this God is that loves them and cares for them. It's to be able to put them to work, to invite them to Mary's kitchen where they can peel potatoes and cut their finger, um, but do it out of a sense of, of service and sacrifice, to work in the thrift shop or to, do, to open the door so that people, other people can be blessed. And so those of us who have blessings, to use it to bless others, to invite them in and to be part of the community. And then a third piece. Um, the good shepherd protects his sheep. The good shepherd protects his sheep. You know, there are lots of wolves out there. We live in a dangerous world. There are lots of wolves out there. Um, the biggest wolf that's out there that Jesus came to do battle with is the wolf of death and sin. Right? So, so the response of the good shepherd when the wolf comes at the sheep, the good shepherd stands in between the, sh the sheep and the, and the wolf and allows the impact to, to hit him. And he defends the sheep. He absorbs the body impact of the wolf. And so Jesus gave his life 
um, for us and forever demonstrated that to protect the sheep, to give the gift of love in relationship, always endures. The wolf is always a coward. The wolf will always fail. And so we stand to protect our sheep, to be able to, to know that there are things that would be dangerous. So as you raise kids, you know, you teach them you know, not to play out in the road and not to do things that are dangerous because, because harm can happen. And so we who have the blessings and we who have the gifts to be able to look for those who are weak and to protect them. In the gospel lesson for this morning, there's a, there's a, a, a powerful um, image of God's protection, or of Jesus' protection of the sheep. And it is uh, the very first verse. It says, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. Now for us, I mean, generally that kind of goes over our heads. You know, what does that mean? It's just another feast or festival, right? No, the, the festival of the dedication was the festival of the dedication of the temple. About 150 years before this happened, uh, the um, Antiochus Epiphanes was a powerful Syrian leader, and he came through and he conquered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and he took out the holy uh, vessels that were there, and he went up to the altar, and he sacrificed a pig on it, and he erected a statue of a pagan god. The Jews were not very happy, right? Not very happy about that at all. And so, uh, and so God raised up a guy by the name of uh, Jacob Maccabeus, and he and his family, his sons, became rebels, and they led an armed struggle against that uh, foreign army that was there. And eventually, at the cost of his life and three of his sons, they drove them out of Jerusalem. And then they cleansed the temple, and they rededicated the temple to God. That's what this is. That is the feast of the dedication of the temple, the cleansing of the temple. And so now the Romans are there during Jesus' time, right? The Romans are there. And so uh, it says they came to the feast, the festival of the dedication. It was winter, and, uh, and the Jews were gathering around him, asking him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jacob Maccabeus was called the Messiah. He was called the Hammer, the Messiah. If you are the one who's to come, tell us plainly. All Jesus had to do was just to lift a finger, and people would have grabbed spears and swords and been willing to die a martyr's death to get these Romans out of here. But Jesus says, you know, you're not, you're not hearing me because you're not my sheep. I'm doing my father's will. There is a flock here that needs to be protected. All that Jesus taught, everything that he was about and the power of his resurrection was at risk in the power politics of his day. And Jesus was able to, to as, as, uh, as enticing as it would have been for all of his disciples and the religious leaders, as enticing and inviting as, as political power would have been, He's willing to sidestep it and say, no, I do what my father tells me. My father and I, we're one, and I watch over this flock, and I care for them to protect the flock from the dangers that are around us. I have to say, um, in this current world of ours, the political environment is toxic, don't you think? I mean, the things that we say to each other and do to each other in the name of political power is just really, it's, it's amazing. Um, and we don't often see it as dangerous. But as it preoccupies us, and as it divides us, separates us from the people God has given us, given into our care, it becomes destructive of the purposes that God has for us. I know family members who will not speak to each other because of the political rancor uh, that is, has infected them. This need for us to be attentive to who is it that we stand for? And do people know that the most important thing in my life is not allegiance to politician A or B. The most important allegiance in my life 
is to the good shepherd? Do they know the, poor, the, the place of this good shepherd in my life? I'll tell you, the, um, the, my, one, uh, my one appearance in national television, um, and it was, so I, was the, uh, I was a senior associate uh, at, the, at my previous church, and the rector had left town, and I had a, uh, a gentleman who was involved in the, in the Republican Party at the time um, came and asked me if it would be okay in the parish hall if we screened a film. And at that point, <coughs> we were leading into the election between uh, George Bush and Al Gore here in Florida. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, the film was a George Bush man of faith. And so it was about his religious faith. And, uh, and uh, so this gentleman came to me and asked me if, uh, if it would be all right if, if they showed it in our parish hall. And, uh, and would I be willing to moderate it to make sure that the, the conversation was wholesome? And I said, well, I would do that um, on the condition that we didn't advertise it. So it would just be word of mouth. It would not be a parish event. It would be an outside event. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I was unrestricted in terms of my ability to, to moderate um, and handle questions. And so he agreed to that. And so the day came, and, uh, and the, the room was packed. And, uh, uh, and they showed the film. And in my head, I'm thinking, so this could be actually a series. We could do this one about George Bush, Man of Faith. Um, Al Gore had come out with an inconvenient truth. And so we could do the same thing for Al Gore and kind of have the same kind of, of, of conversation there. So, um, so the, the day came, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the room was packed, media was there, and uh, the film was shown. Uh, people were, uh, they were energetic in their conversation, but it was, um, uh, uh, but it was, everybody was uh, well behaved. You could tell that some people were working really hard to be well behaved. Um, and, uh, and so then the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the time came to an end, and so, uh, so uh, I said thank you to everybody, said I think a closing prayer. And then a good friend of mine, uh, she is an attorney, and she was sitting on her hands, and her face was crimson red. <laughs> and she came up to me, and she's a very articulate woman and a very good friend, and she put her finger in my chest, and she just let me have it with both barrels. I think three barrels, I think, <laughs> is what she gave me. And, uh, and that's okay. I don't mind it when people give it to me, especially when I've had the platform. And so, uh, but I mean, she, she uh, really did, and I'm sure I responded. Um, what neither of us knew was that my microphone was still on. <laughs> and there was a camera from ABC News in the back corner. And so that clip... That clip was on, uh, was played on Nightline with, with Ted Koppel <laughs> that night. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the phone calls and the emails poured in. Now, it was a great church. We did all kinds of great things. That's the one thing <laughs> that made the media a fight between two very good friends over political power. And then the rector came back and we had a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> we are given, we are given the calling, the privilege of being shepherds for the people who are in our care. Now, politics is important. How it is that we, that we steward the resources is important. But the most important thing is the gift that God gives to us in one another and our willingness to steward them, to shepherd them according to the principles of God's kingdom. It was right for Jesus to ask Peter the question, Peter, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then shepherd my sheep. It's the challenge that, that asks the deepest questions from us, forces us to look at ourselves, and invites us to step into relationships with a power and a grace and a compassion 
that we would not in our own strength even want. But because of him, now we do.